Dr. Lori, I'm at the Juniata Valley Home and Garden Show. You should be here too. My antique appraisal comedy show is going to start soon. Let's see what they've got. It's very pretty. It's a nice piece. It says made in China very clearly on the bottom. Made in China. Um, but what I'm holding in my hand is a lid. And if you can see the lid, the lid is not glazed on the underside. It's only glazed on the top. Okay? So the lid isn't glazed on the underside, only glazed on the top. I'll put this down. If I have to do it again, I will. Um, and it's got a little frog. Frogs, of course, have their symbolism in Asian culture. Uh, this particular piece is uh, a finial, right? A finial at the top. When you see the glaze here, that there's no glaze on the underside, that means that we're probably not going to store anything in this, anything that we're going to ingest, OK? The other thing is it fits beautifully. It fits perfectly. But why isn't it a fish? Everything else is a fish. There's no other frogs, yet the frog is on the top of the fish. So what's the point of that? Should it be a frog? Should it be a fish and not a frog? Why? Or are all these fish underwater and the frogs on top on a lily pad? What do you think? Who, who votes for the frog? Who votes for the fish? It's supposed to be a fish, people. <laughs> it's supposed to be a fish. It's supposed to be a little pink fish like this one. So what happened was, we're making all of these, and if you notice, these little leaves, too, are not the same. The little actual plant material is not the same here. See this one? See these? Also a darker glaze. I think it got switched out. I think there's, one, there's some of these made in China, and they're mass-produced if you've been to China. It's just streets and streets and streets of pottery for the Western market. I think what happened was somebody said, oh, I'm supposed to hit the fish and pick the fish, and they didn't, they picked the frog. <laughs> kind of cute. We've got, an exam we've got a, a reason for it if we say the frog's on top and they're all swimming below, but I think that the, the fish was supposed to be here. How do I know? I evaluate 50,000 objects a year. I've seen others. <laughs> That's why. So how much did you pay at the yard sale? $5 is excellent. What do you think it's worth? It's worth $150. And guess what it would be worth with the fish? More. <laughs> One sixty-five with the fish. No. How much did you pay? Eighty-two dollars. It is set in ten-carat white gold. They are very low-quality diamonds. Not much color. Not much. Not much color and not, not much clarity. Um, but they are Burmese rubies. The um, what's oftentimes called a cluster ring, cocktail ring. That ring easily has a market value today of about $500. Burmese rubies, very popular in the 1940s and 50s. And does this come up? Look at how nice the inside is versus the outside. You know? Well, sugar, it'll, it'll keep yeah. you, right? Kind of preserved, you know? My hips are preserved from sugar. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Pepsi Cola Company. Long Island City, New York, so right outside of the city. A syrup compound of sugar, cola nuts, caffeine, phosphorus acid, flavoring, and caramel color. Ten gallons. That's what it says. Yes. Yeah. Does it smell? No, it kind of smells more like uh, musty than it does of syrup. Now, I want you to look at the, the logo here. Look at the logo. Look at the, the actual work on the bottle cap of the logo. See that? Pretty nicely done. And then I want to see, see how times has changed because, ah, lo and behold, there's a Pepsi. There's a, there's a Pepsi cooler behind me. So how about that? Look at that. I don't know if you can see it, if you can get it. But look how the logo has changed over time. The idea of having these cursive, swirled logos like that came from Coca-Cola. And the Coca-Cola logo actually came from the accountant who was doing the books who wrote the first Coca-Cola. That's where we have those, those actual um, cursive or script Coca-Cola pieces. Pepsi-Cola follows the lead. This particular piece, of course, and you said it was there for years, probably from the 40s into the 60s, yes. and value on this particular piece. In this particular condition, about $175. In good condition, $450. Oh, you're so funny. A lot of you do that. 
a lot of you, I felt sorry for it. You know, like the doll's going to get up and cry, you know? I felt sorry for it because no one's bidding on it. Oh, you know, and all the auctioneers think that's great. They're like, yeah, great, feel sorry for it. Just bid it. I'll take the buck. You know, that's what they do. But this particular doll is made to look old, okay? A little old, probably dates to about the 1920s, but then made to look older. And I don't know if you've ever seen these shows, but there are a lot of shows out there of how you can make stuff look older. Like, you can rub coffee grounds on it, and you can put, like, honey over their face, and you can put, like, olive oil on the piece and rub it on and rub it off. I mean, there's a lot of ways to make things look older. Or you can just do what I do, just keep aging. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, But that's basically what you're looking at. The, um, the piece dates to, again, early 20th century. It has, of course, the, um, the, the, um, the hide hands, the hide feet, which are the hide legs, which are actually painted. So you got it for a buck, which was great. You got two of them for a buck. Was it a boy and a girl? Yes. It was a boy and a girl. It's usually a boy and a girl. The back of the hair, you can see that this is the girl because she has little braid ring, little curls, ringlets at the back. You can see that they painted her ear. They even painted in the little curve of the ear. It's a nice piece, I got to say. I'm going to turn it this way. And I would say value on this piece for your buck investment, you probably made 90 times what you put in. It's worth about 90 bucks. Good for you. Hi, it belongs to your nephew. Yes. Okay. And he said, would you bring this to Dr. Lori? He's working today. So what's he going to do for you? <laughs> I'm serious. This is a big deal. You never know. You're going to ask, hey, you're going to take me to lunch? Because, you know, I brought it to Dr. Lori. It's not every day Dr. Lori gets to look at something for you. Does he play it? No. No? Um, Did his father play it? Really? Right. <laughs> So 1860 to 1861 to 1865, when Abraham Lincoln was president, this piece comes from Norway. Yes. Really? And all his ancestors are One more time. Really? <laughs> really? Well, he's got a story, that's for sure. His ancestors are from Norway. That's all he knows about it, huh? Norway. We don't know if it works. We have some kind of Norwegian connection to it, and that's what we know. Okay. First of all, it should be in working condition. I don't think it dates to the middle part of the, set of the 1800s, 1861 to 1865. I think it dates closer to 1880 to 1900. I do think it could be Scandinavian. Here's why. Notice the different coloration of these particular keys. Notice also the different use of what's called rose malling. Rose malling, which is hand-painted work on Scandinavian woodwork. That's called rose malling. They see it on furniture as well as on decorative pieces and also on pieces like this. The intricate, um, the intricate work here, which is, of course, um, marquetry work, uh, does also look Scandinavian. However, the bellows are perfect, and I don't think they would be that way if, they, if the piece was that old. And also, the style and design of the piece is not that old. We don't see this coming into widespread use until about the 1880s, at least. I've seen the whole piece. Oh, okay. Now, well, va value, was made in Germany. value, yes, so it comes from Norway, but wasn't made there. Okay. This particular piece and others like it, which I've seen many times, are going to have a secondary market value of about $500. If it works, if this sticks, you know, if the keys start to stick, then that's not working condition. So... I would say $500 as it sits. Nice. Thank you. You're welcome. This piece is an Alexander Backer piece, and it's kind of valuable. <laughs> Here's why. Alexander Backer, A-B-C-O, which is the label we've got on the bottom of this particular piece, is a relatively well-known Art Deco-style piece manufacturer with the Afghan dogs and the taffy pull elongated women, you know, women the way I always wish I was, like a big taffy pull, right? <laughs> You can just pull this side, maybe elongated, but really beautiful with the Afghan dogs. It's made of a composition matter, so it's a hard matter. And typically, they could be used either as um, bookends or just as a decorative piece. So it doesn't surprise me that Grandma would have had this, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, that Grandma would have had this on her, uh, where'd she have it on her dining room table? What made you bring it here today? Going through the house saying, what about this, what about that? So it's nice condition, it's nicely cared for. On uh, the secondary market, we're right at the 100th anniversary of the Art Deco, so it's gonna be at the highest value it's gonna be for another 100 years, right now. So value on that piece today is gonna be about $400. All right, got a lot of things happening here. One of them is a disaster waiting to happen <laughs> because this is gonna come out. 
How did we acquire the reverse glass painting of the horseshoe curve? You think it's your mother-in-law's, so it came down the family. The, the backboard here on the back, which is wood, which is coming out, so I'm going to be careful. I'm going to put it right back down, probably. Um, the backboard here it indicates to all of you, no matter what it is, a painting, a sculpture, or something else, this particular backboard always, always, always means that the piece was put into the frame sometime around 1900. Okay? Now, you have important pieces in reverse glass painting. Many people did reverse glass paintings. Most of them were landscapes. Many of them are still kept, especially in um, uh, East, uh, central Pennsylvania. This one is the horseshoe curb, which is a terrific piece. And it's terrific for a lot of reasons, but first of all, it has to do with the fact that this particular piece, um, this particular piece is, in fact, extremely nicely preserved. There are a couple of problems which happen to all of these reverse glass pieces, but it shows a particular place, and that's what's important. So, first of all, you've got a little bit of loss here and some flaking, but that horseshoe curve of central Pennsylvania, very well known. Um, you also have a lot of nice detailing in the painting, but again, this is from heat, and the heat is retained by that wood in the back. The wood has off-gassed and it's retained all the heat behind the glass, so the glass just baked, and because there was paint on the glass, it baked off the paint. That's what you have. In excellent condition, this is a $750 piece. In this condition, it's worth about 600 bucks. And I know you had another one of the Susquehanna River, and I didn't look at the condition, but I will look at the condition. That one might have been just about the same value, depending on condition. But again, the horseshoe curve is something that everybody knows. Another great show outside of State College, Pennsylvania.